This is The Michael Bryan Show. Hi everyone, welcome to the Michael Ryan Show live and I'm joined with Gran, Viveka, Pita and Puria who are social media influencers in the travel, lifestyle, fostering and dental space and they're sharing what it's like to be social media influencers, the good, the bad, the ugly and some funny stories along the way. Thanks so much for joining me, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having us, I'm so excited to be here. Same thing, thank you Michael. So what I thought we'd kind of dive into is how you all got started in social media. So some of you have professions as well. Some of you, this is your full-time thing. So I thought I'd start with Viveka, with how you got into social media. Why was it appealing to, to dive in and not just kind of do what other people would do for their profession as well? Yeah, so I actually, (laughs) I call myself an accidental influencer because I actually didn't mean to have this become my full-time thing. I started off as a performer. I'm still a performer. And I've been able to translate my storytelling skills uh, to curating my platform and making all these videos. And I was really, not I was, I still am (laughs) very passionate about making content for Chinatown. I started in the pandemic. And during that time, I really wanted to kind of spin the narrative, the really negative stigma around a lot of China businesses during COVID and provide this platform for these amazing, hardworking business owners that didn't have the resources to the social media world. Um, So yeah, from there, I kind of pivoted to lifestyle um, while also including them whenever I can. And yeah, now I'm just all about spreading creativity, positivity, and joy, and just living life to the fullest. What about you, Peter? <laughs> well, yeah, yes, for me, you know, so, you know, I'm from Uganda. So when I came to the United States, you know, I had travel over the world. I'd never seen a black person who was adapting or in Uganda or in Ethiopia or in China, in every place that I, I travel. So I, I believe that you have to be white and you have to be, you know, married in order to, to adapt. But, you know, so for me, when I went to, 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 to force care, I wanted to mentor and the social worker said, hey, have you ever thought of being a force dad? I was like, yes, but I don't think I qualify. I'm seeing one. She said, no, you can. And so I chose to do so. And while I'm doing classes, everyone was looking at me like, where's your wife? I'm like, no, that's just me. And I, I noticed that everyone was kind of strange to look at me as a single man. And that's when I realized like, hey, if there's few men, maybe I need to change the narrative of what parents look like. You know, I believe the lie as a black man from Africa that you have to be white to adapt, you know, but I wanted to also change the world of where I come from. You know, in Africa, we've seen why people come and do good but we never see our stories told of how good we do things so I thought hey I need to change the narrative of what we think of who helps you know my kids are all Caucasian not by choice you know by need and I wanted to show truly what families look like and that really expanded my my, my, my social media in a way that I did not at- anticipate for me it was just I wanted to get people and change people's thinking about what families look like so that's how I go into social media that's so incredible I got chills as you as you said that it's really incredible work yeah same here <laughs> so I'll go ahead and really introduce myself pretty quickly um, I've kind of got a similar story to you Rebecca I'm an accidental social media influencer because <laughs> yeah um, so I focus in the travel space and I actually opened Instagram because it was a way for me to connect with my friends and my, my, my family because I was showing them where I was at the time, uh, you know, around the world. And at the same time, I just got more people interested in where I was and what I was showing to more people. So I accidentally became a, a travel influencer. I never started this out by looking to monetize or to build, uh, you know, X amount of followers. Uh, it was just to connect with family. And mm-hmm. especially because in the travel space, it's, it's much better to show them where you are than telling them where you are, right? So that's how I got started and things escalated. Not so quickly as I would really love to admit, but um, then, you know, I got partnerships and everything. And then I said, okay, I think I'm into this already. I can monetize and I can continue traveling. It's not coming out of my own pocket anymore. And uh, well, I'll tell you more about me later, but that's how I got started with, with social media, just traveling and people said, "Hey, I really like your content. Uh, you should more. You should do more of this." Uh, well, that's also accidental. You know, I 
never thought I would use Instagram as much as we do today. I didn't really care if my relatives saw me on Instagram. I, if I don't call them five minutes a year, I have their number, you know, they, they know if I don't call them up, I don't really want them to know about my life. I didn't want to know about theirs if that's the case. But we started, uh, you know, as the, as a professional users, we started the uh, Instagram page for our dental practice. It is obviously, I'm a dentist. Everything is visual, right? So we started putting up the work that we do pretty much videos, pictures, before, afters, um, videos of things that are that you don't usually see, surgical procedures, um, final results, things like that. And then it just escalated. You know, everybody started asking questions. We started seeing patients from all over the state from New Jersey. I'm in New York myself, so it's a little weird getting patients from so far away, but they, you know, share the videos. They uh, start following us. It, it makes sense, right? You want to, if you want to choose a dentist, you want to go to someone whose work you're familiar with, right? Because it's very difficult to find the person you want, and it just helps them decide, okay, is this the type of work that I want to receive? Um, you know, with the type of work that we do, obviously people started coming in more. And now I think 90% of our patients find us through Instagram. So mm -hmm. that's how I ended up using it so much. It's, it's interesting how it all, it, you're all doing it in your own unique way. You're doing it in the way that works best, whether it's collaborating with brands, whether it's sharing behind the scenes to build that stronger connection, whether you're trying to do something on a more of a change basis whether you're trying to make the change that you want to see and all of those things you're all creating content for your own unique way and i guess that's one of the things that makes it very exciting right now is you can create the content that you want to create you don't have to follow a blueprint you don't have to do anything that you don't actually want to do and i thought i would open the floor up a little bit in terms of how you found that out was it trial and error purely and you looked at the numbers and thought i'll keep doing more of what works and i'll leave off the things that don't it was more of a business kind of thing did you learn about business how to build connection with a potential client and you just scaled that up again we'll start with Rebecca. we'll do ladies first on purpose by the way how do you go about creating the content is it thoughtful is it just random What's your process like? Ooh, really interesting question. I would say that when you're passionate and you love something and something just brings you joy and you enjoy doing it, it's from your heart, you know, you're feeding your soul. That's where I get inspiration for my content. You know, everything about my personal content is, oh, if I like a spot, I would love to share with you. And maybe you resonate with that, you know, so I just love sharing things that make me really happy. And, you know, I feel like in this climate and world, like it's really important to just be really passionate about what you're doing. How about you, Peter? You know, you know, I think for me, like I, we, we've kind of grown up from a side where it says men do this and women do this. And, I, and I'm against that. <laughs> you know, I, I come from a very abusive family as a, as a kid. My, my dad was abusive so much that I was a street kid for, for, from the age of 10 to, to 15 and a stranger changed my life. And, and I think for me as a false parent, I wanted to journey as a male, like, hey, men, we can be tender, we can care, we can be as, as any other parent as, you know, I think not always saying it's mom's role, but saying it's a parent's role, every parent can do that. So for me, it was a little bit easier, you know, of course, there are restrictions of, you know, how much I can share about my kids, what I can show, you know, so I had to really stick to my journey as, as, as a kid who grew up from uh, poor, uh, abusive, uh, and, and as a street kid, on how I beat my odds, you know, how I looked at the future, and you know, try to use my past to do good for myself and for those around me, you know, in some way that I didn't want people who were following me or who were listening to me, and I wanted to be vulnerable and say, hey, we all have a past, but we can use it in some way as a foundation to do better for ourselves, and that's why I'm a force parent, not because I have resources, because I managed to overcome the abuse and the trauma I went through, and so for me, that connected really well, that it wasn't so much about my kid, but it's 
was more of really how I overcame uh, the arts and, and, and how I'm able to, to truly turn around and be the parent I never had, you know, uh, break the cycle of abuse that I grew up from, that I could change that, that if I can inspire someone else to do so as a dad, that that was the whole goal. And I think, you know, one media caught the fire and it just went wild, you know, and from there I knew my role, hey, as a male, as a dad, as an abusive, you know, former kid and as a street kid and, and an immigrant from a different country <laughs> to the United States that I wanted to show all the intricates of what my journey was uh, in, 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 in its every way. I actually resonate with you a lot because I think showing the real face of the the everything we have to overcome to where we are is a real path to to show people you know how to overcome their own things uh in in my own case i've been on a zigzagging career from starting on uh, you know from scratch from not being professional at all to understanding how to curate content professionally to showing people the best version out of a hotel the best version out of, out of a destination and from there i six i back into wait this is too perfect it actually doesn't exist mm -hmm. and as, as michael and i discussed in the previous calls uh as social media influencers our role is way deeper than sometimes we can imagine because people actually listen to our advice they go to the locations that we suggest they make some decisions that we suggest uh they they do some medical choices as well based on our suggestions. And if we do the wrong suggestions, we're not legally, you know, owned, but morally we know this falls upon our shoulders. So in my travel space, I realized, okay, I'm getting a lot of followers, a lot of likes, but what is the end goal of all of this, right? It's not just about me, me, me. It's about what am I going to give to these people? And if people are booking hotels, uh, you know, couples are getting married or they're booking flights to getting married somewhere. And what I offered, my envision of the place that I, that I mentioned, fake, or, or at least it's not as real as, as, as I showed. It's upon me that I failed to them. So I went from being unprofessional to being way too perfect. And now my, I found my real role in social media, which is fighting back what I did. And, and, and I'm guilty. What I did and my fellow travelers did, which is being too perfect and just showing the all the beautiful side of traveling, which we know it's it's not. You know, we get in flights with, you know, with people that are screaming and our hotels, you know, our rooms were not ready and all these things that people don't really talk about. So right now, my current role in social media in, in the travel niche is fighting back these people and telling them, yeah, this place is absolutely beautiful, but don't believe that everything that we're showing you is as real as, as it is from, you know, from the camera to, to, to Instagram. So this is my current role right now, showing people that the water is not as blue, you know, the room is not as close to the ocean as, as they think, little things like that. And especially because nowadays it's all about cloud. It's really easy. It, it's actually really easy to grow a big audience. It's just a matter of showing people something that is not real because it, it, you are the first person ever showing that. And I have a really good example. I hope I don't get in trouble with this. Uh, there is a video of a forest in China, of a lake forest, that the, literally the forest is, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this, the lake is, uh, it has trees right within the lake and the water is like ridiculously toxic green, which looks really beautiful, but it's just a filter. So right now I'm fighting back these people and letting them know this is beautiful, but it's not real. Here is the actual video of the real lake unedited. So this is what you should expect if you actually go there, because if people are spending their, their savings, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars on, on going there, they're only going to get disappointed. So that is my the assumed role that I have right now and showing people that traveling is absolutely beautiful. But, you know, with my my two cents that they should really go and see for themselves what it actually looks like and not just take it in for granted from an Instagram page that they saw it from. I, I, I love, you know, I love what you just said, you know, because even for me as a dad, you know, uh, people want to force parents or they want to adopt children, but I have to be true about trauma. Like, hey, you, you're you going to adopt the child, but they've come from a hard place and they have trauma. So I love the honesty. Like we grow to say, 
people believe in me. You know, sometimes they wait for you. If you don't post, they're like, I've been waiting. You're like, gosh, you, you know, you, you really believe in what I say. And I like what you say. Like you go back and say, Hey, I want to be the example, but also I want to speak truth of what is really is. Uh, and I love that. So uh, yes, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. Yeah. Also in our case, we do also try to do some of that, right? We try, we put a little thought into what's educational also, right? What, can teach the audience something about our profession, dentistry. Sometimes I do a short video explaining a procedure or, um, you know, uh, uh, something that I think the audience should learn from and they won't get it anywhere else. You know, the type of videos we put put up sometimes, um, they're more unique, you know, you don't see it every day and it has something to teach. That's usually what I try to go for myself what's real what's not real you mentioned it that's that's very true we just showed a raw video you know this is what happens before this is what happens after and then let them decide if that's something you want to look into more i think the impact of our work is huge you know like the fact that we're able to just influence such a huge audience like through a tiny screen to me it's always been so incredible and just heartwarming and you know like I'm sure you all get really amazing messages you know and sharing their stories after you know you shared your story and I think for me it's like the connection no matter where you are in the world no matter what content you post we're able to connect everyone like globally um and that to me is just such a beautiful thing what I find heartwarming in a way is there are so many influencers out there that they don't necessarily connect with the responsibility. When when you think of your content elicits a reaction, a response, an action, a result as a result of what you posted further up stream, so to speak. And sometimes it's hard to prove it as well. You know, you, you post something and you think, well, maybe that won't have the effect that you think, but then six months from now something happened as a result of something that you posted six months ago like there's so many influencers celebrities whatever you want to call them that they're being held accountable for things that they're posting years down the line and this could be when you're a different person you might live in a different country you might have different beliefs and values and you're still being judged in a way based on a previous version of you and that's frustrating for me because I see it almost every day. And I'm sure that will, you might see it as well, whether it's within your profession or your lifestyle or just your close circle of people that you trust. Maybe you bounce ideas off of and you might hear stories of, oh, I've been pulled up about this. I don't know. Let's use travel for now. Been pulled up about this review that I posted about a hotel and someone went on my recommendation and hated it. And you think, okay, well, was that me? Or did somebody else post it? Or was it two years ago when I posted that review and it's gone downhill since? You know, that, 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 that sort of thing. It's so hard to really take that slice of time and think it's going to last forever. Like someone can find this two years, three years, 10 years from now. I'm sure that a podcast from when I first started that people listen and I'm thinking... I really hope they don't. Like I, I really hope that they don't look at it, listen to it, and think, oh, I'm not going to listen anymore because episode three could be awful. And at the end of the day, like I'm nearly six years into this now and things have changed. The interview style probably hasn't. I've just got better at it. And I think that, that that's the thing that as someone that influences people, whether it be one, ten a million, whatever it is, you're influencing your family and friends before social media came along. You're influencing the people that you would go to the pub with or restaurant with or fine dining if that's what you're into. You influence the people that you're connected with. And whether it's one or a million or 20 million or 100 million, I think sometimes we can forget that with the number of connections that we have, it just goes bigger. I don't know about you, but whenever I'd have conversations with my closer friends, I still feel weird about recommending something that I was unsure of. Like I'd had to be sure before I would do it. 
And this is just amongst friends. Like, it almost did, didn't matter what my recommendation was. They would either decide to do it or not. We're going back before social media now. I am old enough, by the way, for those that don't know. I'm old enough. I grew up with a phone that had an antenna, you know, and all you got was the radio. That that was it. That was what the phone was. And I think that people can forget this mental battle, this sense of if I do this, something bad might happen. So I have to be sure. I have to know. I have to take on that burden, that responsibility and say, you know what? I fully stand behind this. That's why I'm posting it. And I think we're trying to grow away from just posting your food and that's it. I, I've done it. I've been guilty of it. When it first came out, I was posting pictures of where I was, pictures of my meals and no one cared. I didn't really care all that much. But you do it because that's what everybody else was doing and you had to ask yourself, well, what are people actually posting on these things? What are people actually posting? And you start going off what other people do. Where well, now we're going to a different level where I'm sure we can all talk about this, whereby the responsibility has gone completely out the window. And it was Jan that mentioned the, the filter for the forest on the lake or the river. And it just made me think, like, how many people do things to get the false perspective of what it is, the false version of what it is. And they think, yeah, but the responsibility that comes from that is crazy because people will go and think, oh, it's so much busier than what it looks like on the picture or on the video. And you and you realize, oh, they've actually had conversations with everybody beforehand telling them all what's happening, sending them flyers or posters or whatever, and say, look, don't stand here, don't stand there, we're doing this. And if you're in the way, we've got to redo it until it's done. So if you get out of the way now, you won't have to do it again. And you, you end up orchestrating this whole thing for something that's not actually true. So I wonder, do, do you actually have this moral, have to be responsible element to it? I don't just mean for people like, you know, Puria that's a, a dentist as well and Peter that does the, the fostering. So we might have some privacy concerns alongside all of this. More for Viveka and Jan as well of, do you feel that? It's not just me. I hope it's not just me. But do you also feel that? And uh, you feel a sense of, okay, we have to be careful here and actually stand behind what we're posting. So many good thoughts to touch on there. <laughs> um, I do feel there is a pressure for sure, but I've kind of adopted like a little a system for myself where I have, I ask three questions before I post anything, anything at all. Is it kind? Is it necessary? And is it true? So I say this because I started off, you know, in a lot of Chinatown and a lot of food wrecks, you know, and sometimes the experiences, not just in Chinatown, but in New York City in general, the food experiences aren't great, you know, but sometimes you have to post and you're like, oh, I need, I need content. So when I first started, I sometimes would post what I would say, like a Yelp video where it's just very honest. Um, and, you know, maybe has a tad bit of negativity to it because my experience wasn't positive, but I would have no filter and I would just like, you know, say everything. But then I started realizing that that was just my experience, you know, just because I didn't have a good experience doesn't mean someone else wouldn't. So that's when I started moving away from like, if I don't like something, I'm just not going to post about it. Um, so in that sense, just morally, I feel like I can look in the mirror at night knowing that I didn't destroy someone's business because the weight of our words are so, so in in integral. You know, it's so important, our impact, right? So that's kind of like the system I've adopted for myself. And I have said, wrong things before on my platform and immediately I take accountability for it and I think that's also something really important to remember we're not perfect even though we have a large platform and we have this audience we're not perfect we're human beings you know we were we've all had different experiences growing up um, and we're going to continue to learn so I think as long as we stay with an open heart and open mind um, 
And, you know, if someone feels that your content is harmful in any way, then we reflect on it. And for myself, okay, I like, I completely take accountability for it. And next time it will never happen again. And that's kind of like how I take the pressure off a little bit, knowing that I can give myself grace when these things happen. Yeah, very well said. And with that mentioned, we also need to take into account that our actions not only resonate with our followers, but they also have some kind of effect on the places where we go to the the restaurants, the hotels, uh, you know, every other client or partner that we recommend or not recommend, it affects everybody. And I can give a couple examples on this. I went into this hotel in Paris. I'm sure everybody has seen it on Instagram at least once. This this beautiful hotel with a rounded window that you can see the Eiffel Tower right in the background and the bed is right next to the window. Uh, we got invited, a friend and I, to that hotel. And when we arrived to the room, we noticed that the bed is not there. The bed is actually near the wall. The, the, the window is just a window where there is a coffee table right next to it, there, but there is nothing. So we got into the room, we checked in, and the first thing the staff told us is, don't move the bed. Everybody's moving the bed for the pictures. We will fine you if, if you move the bed. So we understood that influencers get red room, move the bed to a location where if you book the room, the bed is not there. I felt guilty. And I actually went under this because I got to a room where the bed was not where the influencers showed me where it was. So I felt really bad. And I felt like, like I was virtually scammed by, a, by something that doesn't exist. So I felt guilty and I said, I need to show people that this is not how it is. And the hotel, well, it's a luxury hotel. They don't need more money. They don't need more stays. They already have all the stays and traffic they will ever need, uh, mostly from Instagram, from previous influencers. But they actually got to a point where they, they, they warned us, don't move the bed. We know if influencers like moving the bed, don't move it. We will charge it. We will fine you. You're damaging the wooden floors that are from the 17th century or whatever. Uh, so you're hurting more than, than helping by putting the bed somewhere that it's not belonging. And unfortunately, this hotel knows, but many other hotels don't know that influencers are, you know, redesigning the entire rooms just for Instagram and then putting them back together. So in that case, now I go as well and I shoot a hotel and I say, okay, do I like it or not? I'm not going to perform an imaginary play where something is where it's not. So if I like it, I'll shoot it. If I don't, I'll just say thank you and I'll just leave. Uh, so that's also my integrity that that's coming into play with something. If I don't like a place, I'll just be polite. I leave. I pay if I have to, and I'm then I, then I leave. If there's something worth telling, I'll tell it for sure. If it comes into agreement, if I'm getting paid, if I'm getting if I'm eating for free, if it's a startup, whatever it is, but uh, I don't have to follow an agreement if I don't think it will resonate with my followers. Or as example is as you said, if it's not that if it's not if it's not of value, then What's the point of doing it at all? Um, in another example, uh, well, <laughs> I, I've just seen so many of these, um, but I have also seen hotels where, you know, they don't even want influencers anymore because they're hurting more their image, more than they're helping. So in my field, I've just experienced this so much so that sometimes I just don't want to go and do things without asking first because I may get in trouble and I may be selling the, the wrong idea. That's, that's just one of many examples. But just like, you, I think you, you grabbed that copy from uh, from Socrates, right? That he said, uh, he asked the three main questions about gossip, right? If it's valuable, is it worthy? And is it true? If it's not, then why do you assume it, right? I, I think that's a great example on how we should approach things with integrity when it comes into business. Because we're really hurting people if we're giving the wrong piece of advice. And it's not my own case, but I've had friends that actually have gone to locations and they died by taking a picture near to a, uh, you know, somewhere dangerous and they fell to a precipice or whatever. Uh, so we really don't understand the harm that we're doing to people by showing, especially in my field, dangerous or illicit activities. Like there is a reason, there's a sign that says it's forbidden to enter here. And people don't really understand this. Yeah, exactly. And in my field, sometimes even when I go into other Instagram pages and they post about this, I, I let people know, you shouldn't post about this because people actually listen to you and people have got killed from, from this kind of advice from saying, I want the same picture in the same place. And it's very real, but there's a reason why, you know, the locals and the police are telling you don't go here and you're putting more people at risk. I think 
a few years ago when Mount Etna in Italy uh, erupted, some firefighters had to go in to rescue influencers. So they're putting even more people's lives at risk because they have to now go and enter and rescue some people. So that is, that is how I see the role. That's how I approach things. No matter how dangerous or you know, entertaining the idea is, I will avoid things that will put me in danger and I know I'll be putting others in, in danger. It's a very, very good point. And as a bit of a, a transition a little, I wonder what Korea would say in terms of, because it's, it's a profession, you're a dentist as well. Do you have a bit of a set of questions similar to Viveka where because it's your profession as well, do you add that in? Does your professional courtesy, privacy, the treatment of clients, does that translate into your content as well? And then we'll hear from, from Peter as well. But I'd be curious about your side of things, Puria. Yeah, I mean, that's especially true in our case. We we put our work, right, the work that is done here, especially, right, we're not promoting anybody else's. A part of my job is to manage expectations sometimes, right? So not everybody is a good candidate for this and that procedure, right? So they come in with the post from, like you said, uh, years ago. They they definitely go and look at it, by the way, in case you were wondering. And they go, oh, I want this. I want it to look exactly like this. <laughs> so if I put something that's not real, that's basically, you know, put it, <laughs> putting myself at a, at, a, at a disadvantage by presenting something that, you know, is not going to happen. So, yeah, we definitely try to put no filters, you know, no fixes, no changes, no photoshops. We just put it as is. So a part of it is to show people what's the real treatment, right? What's real, what's not. Instead of an ad, that, that's what makes it, like, separates it from an advertisement, right? That's what we try to do. Well, you know, I think for me, I'm, I'm so different from you guys for a for, for few reasons. So being a false parent, I have to represent the state of where who owns the child. You know, false kids are owned by, you know, the state. They are biological parents, you know, and then the social workers and then everyone else involved in their lives. So for me, anything I say has to be true or else I will be in big trouble. And I will lose a license. I won't be a false friend because you have a hundred eyes looking at you. The other thing I like is the trolls. The trolls, there's something I like about them because they always humble me and remind me of where not to go, you know? So for me, rather than always see them as these bad people, but for me, they are my red flags. They, I always go back and say, I'm going to post this, but what the troll are going to see in it? You know, you know, you know is it cultural you know, problem that I didn't really think through? Is it, you know, uh, male chauvinists that I'm going to bring? Like, I have to think all of those in order to be able to find, hey, what I'm going to post, you know, is it meaningful? But I would say, you know, the trolls have been really for me a good way to, 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 to rethink about what I'm about to say, because I know they're going to find anything wrong. I mean, they will always find anything wrong anyway, you know, but I think for me, they are my eyes in some way to say, here's where they're going to find negative. And how do I minimize that? How do I find ways on truly how to post things that will protect the children, their parents and everyone else involved, you know? Uh, and sometimes I have to delete things where, you know, you just post something and within 30 minutes, you're like, okay, you know, this is not what I intended. And people are reading in a different way. So delete, you know? Uh, so I've come, uh, you know, come to learn to let go, you know, and listen to those voices as quickly as possible. Definitely an interesting take or not just the content, but also the response to the content as well. Like you mentioned, trolls can sometimes be educational as long as it's constructive. I mean, I can't tell you how many videos I've seen where I go, okay, let's see what the comments are like. And then I'm like, hmm, probably not a good idea. I should uh, I should move on from that. And I think part of, part of the issue that influencers can have is in navigating real life, social media life and also some of the positives negatives this whirlwind that is the the online space that's changing all the time and i thought i sort of go around everybody as well in terms of how do you live life and have 
social media life? Do you have any strategies for managing your online content consumption? Do you, I mean, I know um, there was a, a previous guest that actually, because of his profession, he actually has a set time for when he looks at his phone or his computer and that's it. So he's quite strict with his consumption and it allows him to do other things as well. Like, you know, so many people struggle to watch films these days because they're too busy on their phones, that kind of scenario. And I wonder, so we'll start with Rebecca, we'll go around everybody, but what's your strategies for creating content, consuming content, and do you have a strategy or is it just go with the flow and try to outline it for people that maybe need some help with this? Boundaries get so blurry when social media is both your work and pleasure. I am not great at this. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> as much as I want to be like, I want to be inspiring for all of you. I'm not great. But I will say that I have uh, slowly but surely stopped consuming content as much. So once I post, that's it. I stop doing the mindless scrolling thing. Um, I, anytime I have a meal with someone, I flip my phone around. I don't check it. You know, like some things can wait. Uh, if I'm getting a shot, let's say I'm at a restaurant, I limit myself to like very, very quick. You know, it's literally I take five minutes to get all my shots and I'm done. You know, like when other people are taking videos of me, I'm like, OK, let's let let's stop now. That's great. Thank you so much. And they're like, oh, you don't want to check it. And I'm like, no, I'm good. Like Because the more you check it, the more critical you are, you know, and it's not about being perfect. It's about sharing, you know, my life. And this was my life, you know, like for the very quick two seconds. Um, and that's how I'm able to kind of like still be present, but work for a little bit um, and have that intertwine. But I don't know if that's helpful at all, but just like really being disciplined and strict with yourself, being like, it doesn't need to be perfect. Like, it's not about that, you know, and it's not about you, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of what I've learned over the years. I actually have the same experience. Uh, as I started with social media and I was, you know, really intense about getting the perfect shot and going to the restaurant. In, in the case where hotels, you know, give you a free half board and they have, they have you have, you know, breakfast, meal and dinner. And you go like, okay, bring out the first dish. Okay, let me take five, seven pictures, 15, 20 minutes. Oh no, my dish is cold already. Can you please reheat it? And then after an hour, you realize, oh my God, I didn't enjoy this at all. <laughs> it's gonna go for, for a great video. But me personally, I didn't get to taste it, right? I didn't get to enjoy it. Uh, I've had cases in restaurants where they prepare, I, I, I'm not lying, they, they prepared 15 to 20 meals. And you don't even get to try it because they're only having them for the picture. That, can I try it? No, 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 no. It's got to go to another table. Like it, it's another person's dish. They just lent it to you for the picture and that has to go somewhere else. So it, it's uh, that's how I was at first. And then I got to manage my expectations as well and mentioning to a restaurant or hotel, just show me two rooms. Don't overdo it. Just show me two dishes, just the best two dishes that you offer or you, you recommend. And that's it. And just like you said, I'm going to get two or three pictures, two or three videos. That's it. Phones down, not social media anymore, no comments anymore. And sometimes I even get like the managers coming in every two minutes. Is, is everything fine? And I'll tell them, everything's fine. I'll let you know if I need something. Because I all over you all the time, like, is this perfect? Do you need anything else? And, yeah, I just want to eat my meal. Um, <laughs> right? Uh, so that's how I first started. And then I understood. I realized I've been to so many trips that I haven't really experienced. Because I was you know, overly saturated with content and getting this perfect shot and getting, you know, getting up at 4 a.m. to climb that mountain and getting that shot. And I was out in the cold and I got their beautiful picture. And then I'm going back to the hotel to sleep from 7 a.m. to 11 because I need to catch up with my sleep. Like everything is so not perfect at all. Um, to the point where I realized I need to separate my life. If I want to go on vacation, I'll pay for my hotels, period. I don't have to commit to anything. I just want to enjoy. I want to wake up at 3 p.m. if I want to. I don't want to pay. I, I don't want to, you know, get a free meal because it's not the dish that I need or that I want. So if I want my perfect vacation, it's not going on social media, actually. Um, so that's how I separate things. And an unpopular opinion, I don't know if you guys shared this with me, but I don't like social media. <laughs> 
I, I don't like social media. I, I do this for a living. I promote things for a living. But if it's not for a living, if I'm not getting paid, I'm not touching it. I, I don't consume content from other people other than the necessary in my, in my skill of degree. Um, I don't, you know, I don't scroll endlessly just like many other people. Uh, sometimes I go on dates with other people and they're on their phones and, oh my God, look at this funny picture. Yeah, yeah, I noticed it. Okay, let's go back to eating. Because I, I don't consume time or content on social media because the amount I do already from work is enough for me other than me going to the extra step and saying, okay, I consume two hours of content for work. Now I want to do another two extra hours for myself. No, thank you. That, that's not me. So contrary to the belief, other than me posting and engaging with three or four people at a time, I don't even touch my phone at all. I don't have notifications turned at all. At all. Sometimes I go out with people and they go like, oh, I got a like. I don't even know how the Instagram notifications look like because I have them turned off. So like, oh, can I see that? Oh, that's how a like looks like. Okay. I, I, I'm completely oblivious to how these things look because I really try to get away from social media as much as I can. Uh, not just on Instagram, but also on Facebook. Uh, so that's how I, I try to do my thing so that I also don't get, you know, overly saturated. Other than the things I have to do from work, I try not to touch social media at all. Right. Well, I need a trip from you. So, you you know, you need to offer me your trip so I can take all my kids, my six kids somewhere, you know, stay in your other hotel. I would like that. You know, but you know, I'm a single dad of six kids. Like literally, you can think about like, I mean, there's no time to. Sometimes I can't find my phone, you know, because my child took it, and I have no idea. You know, my the other part is I've learned to truly what I post. Make sure that I have thought through themes. You know, I want to talk about having a toddler. You know, I want to be honest about having no sleep as a dad of a toddler. You know, you know, when I started, I would, you know, take good pictures and, and that was really cool. But when I started posting the no good pictures, the real, those were more like than the other ones. So I thought, hmm, wait a minute. Actually, you know, the average Joe lives a life like I do, you know? So if my kid has eaten food and it's from here to here, that's a cool story to tell about because it really shows what a father looks like, you know? It really shows what any other mother somewhere, you know, what they go through, not a perfect picture, you know? And so for me, that way, you know, that stress that went off because I just wanted to just be real and show, you know, <laughs> as a parent, you know, you want to show the ugliness and the truth too, you know, to be vulnerable, to say, look, I have a teenager and they have hormones that I cannot understand, you know? And in that way, it really helps for me to relate with someone who has a teenager, to relate with someone who has a, a toddler, to relate with someone who has kids who are difficult, to relate with someone who has gone through trauma. If I can be honest, then kind of creating things that everyone else is creating. Like I truly have to really think about what I'm about to say. And that takes time, but also it lets it lessens me being on the screen because I don't have to follow any other person's somehow, you know, script. Yeah, for me, like you guys, my consumption of social media is very limited. It's basically limited to responding to the questions that we get. Um, almost all of them, people want to know about a procedure or, um, or, or um, a product or procedure. So they have clinical questions usually, and you can't let them go unanswered. So we try to answer all of them if possible. Um, like I said in the beginning, I'm very private myself, so I don't really share too much of my personal life, and I don't really look at other people's personal journeys on on social media. And I also like you guys need probably thirty six hours in a day to just get by, so it's really limited to just responding to the questions that come in, which really helps you know patients for sure. But that's that's what I use it for it sounds like we've all got our own individual i guess like barometer for what we can handle and what we like and then what we don't and i found that very often it's the average person in in air quotes i don't like to use that word but for people that are on social media but it's not their job it's not their profession it's not business it's not work it's all kind of just a hobby thing that they do you know, people post stuff. It, it is what it is, you know. I think they're the ones that are more likely to tip over into things that are more 
unhealthy or unhelpful or things with the you know you're on social media rather than going to sleep for instance it's just a very straightforward thing but I, th- I think very often it's that where it blends in a little too much whereby you stop acknowledging what social media and then what's your real life like online life versus offline life so to speak and it actually makes me think that we're in a space where we actually need more people like yourselves sharing how you handle it, what you do. How do you put the phone down so you can eat your meals and not have them cold, like some people mentioned. And it's it's getting into a space now where, for some, it's actually getting in the way of experience in life. Like if you have to go on holiday for social media, it's very hard to get in and out of that businessy content creation mode if you go in there for both reasons rather than go in there for one reason. You know, and if you're trying to post about an experience that you've had with a child and you think, oh, I can't really do that because of this reason, this reason, and this reason, you're then okay to not post it because it it conflicts with maybe your interests or the family's interest or whatever the case is so there's so much that goes into the content that you can post that you are brushing everything else to the side because you simply can't and there are people out there that don't really do that they're just the you know average public person that's just posting they post everything they post their negative reviews they post their good reviews they're posting pictures of their feet on the beach which i've been guilty of and you get into a space where you post everything no matter what that's actually more harmful than than helpful rather than saying right should i i mean is it is it what was it rebecca is it kind is it helpful and is it true no, I'm not going to post that picture of my feet because it's none of those things. I mean, my feet don't look that bad, but I'd never, I'd never force it on anybody. And I think that that becomes difficult when you don't have the boundaries, but then do non-influencers have to have those boundaries or are they free to post whatever they want? I just wanted to share like a really kind of funny story kind of makes me giggle really so you know when you're cheersing with your friends and they're all creators and everyone has their phone out and you're doing the cheer shot but like you look around and everyone's just holding their phone and like it's like such a dystopian like experience for me and it's the same thing when like I'm around my like food influencer friends as as well as you know I'm part of it but like you look around and everyone has their like led lights like really bright and you like take a step back and you're like this is what it looks like like we look like a little bit insane and that's when I'm usually like okay wake up call it's okay to not do that like you look over to the corner and it's all just like bright lights it it feels very dystopian so sometimes when I have those moments I'm like "Hmm, okay it's good to have a boundary right right just right there (laughs) I think for me like you know, we are known everywhere you go. Like people know who you are. And as a parent, you know, you know, you you know, you know, people are either going to criticize you or they are looking for what to say. So I'm on. So for me, I rather just not have anything to do and really pay attention to my children, you know, because being known, you know, as we all, you know, when you have thousands of people that know you, you get on a plane, you get to eat. Like I know you, you know, I love what you do. So you always kind of feel like, oh, you know, so I think for me, knowing people are watching, and I don't want someone to find me in a, in a, in a compromised place with my kids. So I just take, you know, I just don't do that in, if I'm in public, you know, because I just want to enjoy my kids. Most content, I do it from home, where I'm comfortable, and the kids are comfortable in their own place, you know, but outside, Mm, unless if it's a commercial and I need to go outside. But even sometimes I prefer to go when there's no one there. You know, I'm like, hey, I'm doing Casco. Can I come when no one is there, when you're opening up? You know, so that gives me an opportunity to yell at my kids, not worry, someone is going to listen to me. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a great example of, of, of another, you know, dystopian event that, that we usually live. Uh, influencers like us that we're used to making everything look as picture perfect as possible. And in Viveka's case, uh, when you're noticing that you're gathered at a table with your friends, uh, you're taking a really cool picture and you're, you're, you're grabbing some videos and then you turn off for a second, you overlook the whole restaurant 
And you notice every single table is doing that. Even if they're not influencers, they want to become influencers to some lesser degree. And you realize everybody's doing that. And it's not because they copied you or you copied somebody else, but it's just a new culture. It's just a new currency, right? And nowadays, I think the real currency is showing the behind the scenes, the real life, the dystopian scene. So I think nowadays that everybody has that perfect picture because let's be honest, nowadays, it's really easy to, to get coaching, to buy a tutorial, to watch a YouTube video on how to achieve perfection in, in, your, in your business, how, how to edit this photo, how to edit this video, how to you know, like the scene and whatever. It's easy nowadays. And it doesn't really cost that much money to do it, especially nowadays that iPhones have you know, good video quality and you, know, you can buy cheap lighting, et cetera. Uh, so nowadays, the real currency is showing the harsh truth behind this in Viveka's case this could be this dystopian you know landscape of you know you step back for a second you go to a wide shot and you realize this picture is kind of sideways the entrance looks bad this this light doesn't work everybody every table is doing that uh perhaps the next table is waiting on you to finish your scene so they can go in and there's in, 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 in your case, Peter, it could be that, you know, you're getting this beautiful picture, but the, the behind the scenes, your kids started fighting each other or somebody dropped their foot, in, you know, under the table. And, and but this is actually good content because you show the real life about this. And in this perfect world where you go into an Instagram page and you notice everything is perfect, finding something that is not is more enticing because we want to see more of that. Uh, and in your case, Peter, I'm sure you have the same or I don't know how your case goes with clients in which maybe you ask them, hey, can I shoot a one minute video about the the surgery? Of course, I'm assuming you must have their permission, but I'm assuming that you have cases of, oh, I shouldn't have shot this. I'm gonna delete this. I shouldn't show this. Or, or perhaps this is not too bloody or gory that you're going to a case where if I get his or her permission, actually this could be a great example on, when the dentist, the, dentist, the dentist tells you, don't move because you're going to make my job more difficult and you actually grab that on video, maybe this can even help you with purpose. Like, this is what happens when you don't listen to your dentist. Or perhaps you give a review or, or you say, uh, okay, I perform surgery on you. Now you need to wash your teeth, I don't know, four or five times a day for the next seven days. Otherwise, you're going to get an infection. And the, the client says, hey, I got an infection. Yeah, I, you didn't follow my instructions and you get that on video. This is what happens when you don't listen to your dentist. This is what is great nowadays on social media because I'm sure there is other dentists, there's always somebody bigger and better than you. I'm sure there is other dentists on social media that always show, you know, 100% always accuracy, perfect videos in which they don't show that sometimes things just don't go well. Perhaps you made an incision where you shouldn't have. And it doesn't mean that you're not a great dentist. It just means that, you know, everybody's imperfect and some people have their teeth bigger than others like every case is different right so nowadays this is what i found that is the perfect you know you know equation in between doing perfect work but showing that not everything is perfect you get to a great destination but you also show people that you woke up at 3 a.m to get to the airport and this is the new currency showing people the real life scenarios and if you ask me content wise i think this is what's going to help us scale up in the future showing the harsh, mm, ugly, but not being too ugly either, <laughs> uh, truth about our, our, you know, our line of work. You know what so I, I wish for? I wish that there were glasses that we could just all wear and just like record. So we could just live life with the glasses and it's recording so we don't have to whip our phones out. I feel like that would be like a really cool tool <laughs> to stay present, but also get footage without thinking about it. Anyone? <laughs> I don't know if I want that. Well, if you make the wrong incision, for first of all, let me give you a little bit of advice to any healthcare professional. If you make the wrong incision, delete that video because it could be used against you one day. But <laughs> also, the bloody videos, those are the popular ones. The, the bloodier, the better. <laughs> but yeah, it does take a little bit of engineering. You know, we, we do want to engineer, but not too much. Like I said, they people would expect to get that you put out, right? You put the video out, they want it to look like that. So you don't want to over-engineer it either. 
I watch this, I don't know what you call, you know, when they're pulling out the incest from people's skin. I don't know why I watch those, but I get to watch from when they came and the whole shebang and it's not pretty, but I can't stop watching it when I start watching. But you're like, you, you're absolutely right. Like the, the, the process of how things get to is, is, is fascinating because I think we all go through that process, but we never show. So seeing someone show it, it's kind of really, wow. You know, I'm going to see how they're going to pull that parts out. Yeah. I, I don't want to say it's, it's not snuff, you know, but it's, it's something you don't see anywhere else. Like you don't see real blood, right? When you watch a movie, you know, for sure, that's not real blood. And you also don't want to watch a violent you know, act <laughs> in real life. So this is kind of in between. So you get to see some blood, but not for the wrong reasons. You know, maybe that's, <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah, and actually, I think it can also be refreshing. Like, even if I go and watch your videos, like, I know you won't be my dentist just because you are two or 3,000 kilometers away. But if you do example procedures or you give suggestions, like I'm getting a specific procedure done, and I just want to see something else that underwent it. And you give an example. Even you from a distance pacified me. You called me. You called my nerves just from really far away from abroad. So even if I'm not your client myself, you help me somehow. Because now I know that when I go to my own dentist, which is a few blocks away from me, now I know what to expect. And I know, okay, it may be bloody. It may be a little gory. It's just, just that's just the truth of your business. But if you tell me, this is not going to hurt you. I'm going to put X amount or milliliters of, of uh, you know, anesthesia. You won't feel a thing. Uh, even from far away, you can do a lot of benefits for me because you're calming down before I'm going to my own dentist. So you can help far more people than just your own clients. So that's that's a great thing in, in your business. Oh, yeah. Most most of the time, most of our questions is, oh, that hurts a lot. That looks like it hurts a lot. Does it? And I'm like, no, this patient is not even numb. Look at it, he's calm, he's awake, he, he's not experiencing anything, so it's not really a painful procedure. Just go for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Do you find that sometimes it's actually helpful to not pre-plan? So the amount of times I see things, I go, oh, I wish I had my camera out, or I wish I had my phone out to record that, because it'd be amazing, it'd be true, and it would also be something that would actually be beneficial for the person. But because it's spontaneous, and you think, oh, as a Vecca said, with the sunglasses, I actually think um, Snapchat went through a phase of having, like, snap glasses, which had, like, recording devices on glasses, and I think I saw a teenager with one once. It, it becomes, like, uh, a thing that you wish that you had it after the fact, and then you sit there and think, oh, should we should we try and recreate that this time and have a camera and then we'll we'll get it. And it's never the same. I saw someone do it and you would think it was like they were re rehearsing a play after it had just been done spontaneously and went really, really well. And everyone was like, oh, wow, do that again with the camera out and we'll... Uh, will record it do you find that 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 ever happens to you where something happens spontaneously so we'll start with the vecca again and then then you think oh, well maybe we could do it again or do you ignore that and say you know what if it happens it happens and we'll just kind of go from there like it must be so hard to recreate something that's supposed to be spontaneous I think when something is spontaneous and you don't have your camera or your phone, that moment is meant to be experienced spontaneously. So I personally try not to recreate it because like if I recreate it, then it's like, it's just not my experience, you know, because the beauty of it is that it happened on the spot and like in the present. And like, sometimes it's okay to just stay present. Sometimes it's okay to not film every single thing that happens in your life. You know, like life is meant to be lived, not captured. Right. So if you happen to have your phone or your camera, or whatever in that moment, and you like want to like whip it out, great, like you do you. But like for me, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm at peace with knowing that that moment is going to be in my heart and cherished there, you know? Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think it's all about equilibrium, right? You have to have a sense of degree on, on a, 
you know, doing your own due diligence. For example, you're not going to say, okay, let's just see what happens. You actually have to charge your camera. You have to empty your, your, your SD cards. Like you actually have to do the work. But as far as planning ahead too far in advance, like all you need is a flat tire for all your plan to be rescheduled. So there is only so much you can do and prevent other than, you know, being able to predict the future. So in my line of business in, in the travel space, I have also learned that less is more. And not being prepared also helps you being more creative in, in that moment. Because sometimes you can go to a hotel and say, can you please reserve the pool for me for 6 p.m.? And, you know, something, you know, maybe it just starts raining and your whole schedule gets ruined. So just doing the best out of what you've got, I think that's the best. And actually what I've noticed in, in my own case, because I, I've, I've, I've managed a lot of Instagram pages, hundreds and hundreds of pages, spontaneous content is the viral content, not the planned content. It's spontaneous what is actually what's going viral. If you've noticed videos of this kid that is fishing with his dad and his dad is, is recording his kid and suddenly a whale comes jumping out of the water, that's not planned at all, but it's one of the most viral videos on Instagram. Uh, so I think preparing is okay. Uh, discarding, you know, uh, spontaneous content is wrong because you never know that's actually going to be your most valuable piece of content ever. So, and, and it's obviously, you know, it could be the most hilarious piece of content. Uh, in the example of Peter, maybe your kid did something funny that was completely out of script, but maybe that's what is going to warm people's heart the most. And it's going to be your most viral video ever. So I think just having the camera or, or the phone camera ready at all times, but not just being like, like, like this all the time, just being prepared in case something happens, I think that's the most prepared you can and you should be. Otherwise, you fall into the category of not enjoying what you're doing anymore. Yes, you're absolutely right. You know, and especially for me who has kids, you know, they do the most weird things when you unplant, you know, <laughs> you know you're like, dang, that was, you know, I happen to have a phone and somehow they, they do things. You know, yesterday, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, my kid who was the blondest kid you could find, he said, you know, I want my name to be black. And I'm like, you know, I just settled like, wait, what? You, you, you know, and I said, why? He said, well, so people can can know my name, you know, but I think he he was more of, I just want to be like my dad, you know, and he found that name will be the closest thing for him to have that. But those are moments I could never have planned, you know, you know. So, uh, yes, you're right. Like the, the most unplanned are usually the best. Oh, or sometimes the least you expected is cool. To others, it is the most coolest thing ever, you know? Uh, and that's something I've learned, that what amuses me sometimes doesn't amuse others, but also what doesn't amuse me amuses others well. So to learn both words, you know? And, and as, as and, and as you know, social influencers, like I try to listen to my audience. Like there are things I would like to, but they're just about myself that won't help my audience. So I really try to live a life as though they are living in my same, you know, in the same room. You know, like, hey, he's how I would like to inspire you. He's how I would like to educate you about my life, you know? So for me, I'm always thinking about who is listening? Who am I trying to influence? And what I'm about to create, is it really influential? Is it important to them? And that really helps me to know how, when, how. Yeah, I don't know if I relate to you guys on that. In my profession, we don't like surprises. So pleasant surprises are very hard to come by. So <laughs> if it's something surprising, it's usually not good. So I'm not worried about missing it. Sometimes we do get a case that comes out really just incredibly nice and we don't capture it. I'm like, all right, there'll be another one next day or next week. We'll capture that one. So it's usually not a big deal. Yeah, I imagine in, in a lot of different industries that little saying if there'll be another one is probably something that you all experience the whole spontaneous aspect of it is something that because you're living a life so to speak it's not going to be a one-off i don't think that'll ever be the case you'll always have moments where okay well it might happen next year or next month or maybe if i go to a different hotel the same thing might happen or maybe this next client will be the the next thing or hey you know my my child threw their shoe into the ocean oh there's plenty more shoes where they came from like it's going to go back in there at some point and they will find a way 
to <laughs> do it again. And I, I think it's it's something that some people may not understand, but others do, in that there are moments where it's never going to happen again. And even eclipses happen every few years. So to think that your situation isn't going to repeat itself in any way, shape or form, it's just not a very good strategy because you start getting stressed out over having your phone out all the time, praying that the Vecca's experiment with the glasses pulls off and someone creates something that's more more effective. She's currently regretting saying that now. I've mentioned that multiple times. Uh, it, you, you get to a point where you start relying too much on the content, having it there, having it recorded. The amount of times that I used to walk into a gym and people are setting up their recording equipment, spend more time on that than they do setting up their actual workout. And I used to be a personal trainer, so I, I know that this goes on. And uh, people leave weights everywhere, but they protect the tripod. And I'm just thinking you, you really need a life outside of your phone. Like you, you need you need something else going on. And the amount of times that I see influencers that have a life outside of their online space do so much better healthily, mental health, physical health, than someone that's so tied to their online presence, whatever you want to call it, that it it's literally their number one priority. And in some cases, in a way, I can understand it. But then there are people with tens of millions of followers, hundreds of millions of followers, that they plan their content a couple of days in advance, and they've got this cycle of every couple of days they are where they are three days ago. But to the online world, it's then and there. So they're never exactly where they are posting at that time. Why? They don't have a normal life. They can't go to a public place and get away with it. Like Someone like Justin Bieber can't go to the shops, okay? Like, he just can't. There's more going on. He has to go around the back way, or he's got bodyguards, or there are millions of people that go, is that... Oh, it's hard to tell. He's wearing a hood because he has to wear a hood because he can't go out otherwise. Like you will get spotted everywhere he goes, and I think that it's that kind of thing. It's a way of protecting yourself as well. You've got to find a way that protects yourself as well as allows you to do the thing that you're doing. Bit of a weird example using Justin Bieber there, but there you go. I think you get you get to a space where you have to have systems for yourself. You have to have a way of doing it that protects you, protects your family, protects your friends, protects your self a lot of the time. And it's so hard for people to to get because, well, A, they're not recognized in the street everywhere they go. And I wonder if you guys would be up for a bit of a, a rapid fire round. Amazing. All right. So the first question would be, what's the best thing about being an influencer? Community encouragement for me getting to go to so many places uh sometimes uh for free <laughs> yeah scale i guess you could help more people than you would otherwise what would be the worst thing about being an influencer the pressure that comes with having to be consistent for me the trolls that really criticize me and they have no clue about me like they have they have zero but yet they have this negative feeling towards me but I don't know how to educate them about myself. Like they think they know me better. Same here. Uh, the pedestal people put you on once they get to know you and when they try to get the same things through you. Yeah, I think the time it, it takes away from your other activities. Your top tip for someone that would like to start out as an influencer, they want to become one. Mm, start with what you know and what you love. Uh, know your audience just you know once you know your audience I think it helps you to narrow down what you can create find new things don't just try to recreate other people's ideas despite the saying that you know stealing is is better than, than creating um, that's not the case nowadays nowadays you have to stay up to date you know and be really creative and just give it a shot yeah my know Rebecca's answer what you know and what you love I think that's where you want to start 
what's your funniest story that you have whether it's about your industry the content that you're creating whatever it is what what is your funniest thing that's happened the funniest thing is there was one day when I was having a really terrible day and my sandals broke and I didn't want to walk the New York subways barefoot because that's just absolutely bonkers and disgusting to me and dirty. And so I started crying and asking strangers whether I could borrow their shoes. <laughs> and someone said, yes, you can borrow my shoes. And now we're friends. <laughs> well, I think, I think for me is, you know, someone, you know, we're in the store, you know, we, we, we are called on police often. You know, remember I have six white kids and I'm black and he in the United States, the racism can be a little crazy. So, you know, someone see me and say, he sounds different. He has kids who look different. Something is bad about this family and they call the police. So sometimes you smile, you're like, when the police comes, you pull out your papers, explain yourself. And there you go. So those are the, I, I've tried to make them funny rather than negative. Like, here we go, you know? Wow, that's funny. Um, I was went went to Paris and I checked in my bags at hotel in advance, asking them if I could leave them in there while I was road tripping to a really far off location. And they said yes. So they stored my bags for a few days. Uh, and when I came back from my from my road trip to check into the actual hotel, uh, they actually forgot to tell the staff and the managers that the bag was mine. So when I asked for my bag back, uh, they were calling the police because they thought I was trying to commit terrorism because there was, there was a bag stuck in the hotel. They didn't know whose bag it was. And when I claimed it's my bag, I checked it in a week ago and they were like, okay, before we open it, can you tell us what is inside so we can confirm? And they were about to call to the squad team because they thought it was like a threat. And I told them, look, I checked in my bag. I told X person, I don't remember their name. They were, they were here this time of the day, last time of the week. Uh, it's my bag. I'm sorry if somebody forgot to tell you. And then the lady approached me in, in, in you know, this uh, French accent speaking in English. And they said, look, you shouldn't do this in Paris. You, you, you shouldn't leave your bags anywhere, especially without telling. We really we were really about to call the police on you. So <laughs> that's, that's a funny story. That's, for me, it's not one incident that I could think of, but it's it's always funny when people, when patients get on the chair and then they take their shoes off, I could say, or phone or something. So that always seems a little weird and funny to me, but some people do that. <laughs> so, so they walk in and they take their shoes off. That's almost like going into someone else's house and um, trying to be overly polite. I'd always do it, by the way. I'd always recommend taking your shoes off before going into somebody else's house. Who do you guys look up to? Do you have a particular creator, celebrity, or is it family and friends? Who do you look up to? I look up to a lot of creators that just like vlog their life like unfiltered. I think there's something really fascinating and just raw about it. Um, and actually, one of my friends, her name's Lucy, uh, and she basically uh, does her vlogs with no makeup and she has uh she she deals with acne and i just think it's really nice to like normalize you know what just being a real person looks like and i always gravitate towards that kind of content you know i'm not the best cook you know so i always want to learn so it's always good to to kind of watch those who cook from the scratch you know they come and they say i'm gonna make these and they somehow get greenies from the sky you know and for me that is is my it inspires me to learn and inspires me you know uh, on how i can help my kids have different kind of foods very well said uh in my case i don't really look up to anybody bigger than me because most bigger travel influencers are not doing what i want to see from them which is exactly the on raw unfiltered uh, unbiased things about social media. Most of them, if not all of them, except me, are still showing the picture perfect side of things, which is why I don't really look up to them anymore. But rather instead, I look up to these small creators that say, you know what, I'm not perfect. I'm just going to show this. As you mentioned before, going back to the case of the restaurant thing, uh, there is a really funny video on Instagram of this girl that is in Santorini. She's in Greece. She's showing the sunset. And then this funny song is going around. And then she walks back and she shows every other man taking their, their girlfriend's, their, their, their couple's picture of the sunset. And she's like, yep, I thought I was the only one. So if you go to Instagram and you search for the social media versus reality series that many small social media travel creators are doing, I actually look up to them because I, I, I see they're doing this. This is great. 
me with a bigger audience, I can probably help them resonate even further so I can even feature their own content because I want to show people the funny side of travel nowadays. So I don't look up to big people. I look to small people. Me, I think anyone who has something to offer or some someone I can learn anything from would be someone I would look up to in their own field usually. What's your current content creation setup like? Tripods, drones, you name it. Share a bit about what you use to create your content. Just me and my phone. And sometimes I prop my phone up on my purse. That's it. I try to keep things simple. <laughs> Don't overcomplicate it. Uh, the same with me, just my phone. I'd have a little tripod that I put, you know, that if I'm cooking, my kids want to say something. That's pretty much it. And and lighting, you know, I am darker. My kids are all different colors. So sometimes I need to light myself so I can be seen in the picture. That's pretty much it. That's all I got. Oh, man, I wish I was like you guys. My line of degree is so much different. Uh, in my own personal case, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm going to break it down into the three really simple and fast answers. I go by myself and it's just my own vacation. I'm just taking my phone, just grabbing a quick, cool picture of the sunset. That's it. If it's a paid gig, I'm going to take, depends on how much they're paying on the complexity of, of uh, you know, the, the client. Um, I'll take on my camera, my phone, my drone. And with that said, uh, it, there used to be a time where I used to take, you know, the bigger camera plus the smaller camera plus three lenses uh, plus a really big drone. And from now, uh, I have downsized into just the smaller cameras and, and drones that for social media, they do, they do 90% of the work. So when you climb a mountain with 30 kilograms of equipment on your back, you really start appreciating the smaller drones. So I went from, from nothing to really big to the downsizing because I understood I don't need more of this unless it's for Nat Geo or something overly complicated and they're paying like five years or something like that and it's required, then obviously I will have to and I will have to hire somebody that helps me carry my bags, things like that. And in the case of indoor lighting or things like that, we're shooting commercials for cars, obviously the more expensive, bigger equipment is needed because the client demands it. So it depends on that board. But again, as I said before, the less is the better in my case as well. Yeah, I, I too use the phone. I do have a 4K bit, uh, camera and I used to use it, but it just takes so much editing and effort at the end of the day on social media, on a, uh, on a cell phone. It really doesn't make that much of a difference to go to the effort. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing those. I think it's something that a lot of people can take a lot from. And I also think that some people just need to hear it as well. The amount of pictures that are taken when no one knows what the equipment is. Some of the craziest things that um, you've had to endure, I guess, as in which is great. So before we dive off, I'd like each of you just to share how people can find out more about you, what projects are you working on? And then, yeah, we'll finish. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah, if you would like to connect my Instagram, TikTok, it's at Vivica Chow, V-I-V-E-C-A-C-H-O-W. Um, and I love connecting and community. Well, for Peter, if you want to find me and find how I parent, how I inspire others, you want to adopt, you want to force and name it all, you can find me at forcer.flipper. Or you can find me on YouTube or Now I'm Known. I like to make others known. So my whole book and all other things is called Now I'm Known, how we can make others known. And that's what I'm all about. Well, it's simple. You can all just find me on social media as Explorer. That's, that's literally the name. And I'm on Instagram, Telegram, YouTube, Twitter, you know, Facebook, etc. all social media. Uh, so yeah, feel free to drop me a message there. And if, uh, if you have any upcoming travels, let me know. And I'll, I'll be glad to, to meet you up there. Yeah, for me, uh, again, our Instagram uh, page is the best one. First, number one, SD underline impression underline dental. Or my website, first, one SDI dental.com. Thanks so much for being a guest on the show. Those that are listening, feel free to subscribe, share the show, tell others, and also leave a review wherever you are listening into your podcasts.